This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite Tight Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite Tight Foam. When pros need to seal gaps too small for insulation, but big enough to create a draft, they reach for Loctite's Tight Foam. The high-density foam forms a tenacious bond to most common building materials, stays flexible to prevent cracking, and keeps air, moisture, and pests out of the house. Whether you're adding R value to the rec room or finishing a boring basement, give that space a second chance with Loctite Tight Foam. Visit LoctiteProducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. Think about when that's when tar paper first came out, you know, like 120, 140 years ago. And do you think they were talking about it in that fashion? Like, we've got this great product. It, it's got variable permeability depending on the moisture <laughs> content. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Bidding Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hello. Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey, everyone. And our Senior Producer Jeff Rose. Hi there. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, fellas, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Hey, good okay. to see you guys. Yeah. Um, Mike, you were just telling me uh, ahead of the show uh, how much fun you had at Touch a Trade, which was um, a few weeks ago by now. But um, can you just tell folks who might be unfamiliar with the program what you were doing and, and who was there? So maybe we should tell folks what the whole program's about. Uh, Go for in it. A nutshell, and and it's uh, it's an initiative by Hudson Valley Preservation to set up a nonprofit group to uh, introduce young people to the trades by getting them out on a Saturday and actually. Uh, touching tools is pretty much it, or experiencing tools, not just watching somebody else use tools, but get tools in their hands. Uh, the age group that's targeted is uh, the junior high, middle school age, you know, like that, maybe what, 11 through 13. Uh, but we get people that are down to four or five years old, and we put tools in those young people's hands uh, at an appropriate um, level uh, after Patrick has gone through the safety protocols with everybody. And so me as one of the 20 or 30 different uh, activity leaders uh, put together a little project that some kids can have a hand in playing with. And we had things that covered every trade from timber framing to uh, cutting tree limbing uh, to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, running jigsaws, playing with different tools, plumbing, uh, electrical, you know, the whole gambit. Yeah. And I would complete the compliment by saying landscaping and sign painting and window sash making and uh, forging and horseshoe making. It was dazzling, amazing experience. So you saw things that I didn't get a chance to see because I was up at the far, I guess, northern portion of the event and it it was like maybe a it must have been almost a quarter mile from one end to the other uh of the uh the things spread out the activities yeah so uh critical numbers uh 426 people through the gate despite a dire forecast three quarters of an inch of rain was predicted uh it did rain most of the day but lightly it didn't really affect anyone's fun or safety of the event and um gosh it was fun so Jeff may remember um, I got involved with this because I was interviewing Mason on the podcast, and uh, uh, in a slip of the tongue, I agreed to help out with this. <laughs> right, right, Jeff? And now it's a part-time job for you. There's yeah, a volunteer. And it's, 
year round. That's the even. most important work I've ever done, and and I mean that with all sincerity. And you know, uh, a couple years ago, when folks started talking about this idea and planning it, you know, we all recognized it was important work and something that needed to be done. But I don't know that anyone could have imagined how much fun it is and how completely enjoyable the experience is for both the presenters and the people who come there. And uh, thanks so much, Mike, for making it a, a huge success. Number two, right? Yeah, this is our second year. And what's remarkable to me is just the number of people that 426 that come. Um, when you think about putting together an event like this, particularly in the fall when you've got so many other things going on, you know, either taking care of your own property and raking leaves or going apple picking or pumpkin gathering or any of that stuff. And we had all those folks come out and most of them families bringing their young kids. Um, and that was fun to see the parents. And I'd always ask the parents, is it okay if I, you know, give your five-year-old this jigsaw to cut out this <laughs> tiny shamrock shape or a bat shape out of a shingle? And they're like, sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just so like into it. You know, the parents were not afraid of letting their kids. I'm, I'm so used to parents, you know, not even letting the kids out of the house uh, for fear that they're going to get Dirt, grass stains on their clothes, but here they were getting sawdust all over them, head to toe. The uh, one of the core concepts is the activities. The presentations are real; they are meant to replicate real construction work and be a real experience. So much of the world that young people live in today is is fake, and uh, there's been great intent to make this real for the people who come and, and, and I think it's amazing. It's, I was on such a high driving home from that. I, I could barely talk. It was unbelievable. Good thing you made it home without running off the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> what the, have you been uh, doing, Brian? You've been out with Mike, as I understand it. I, yeah, this week. Um, and, and interestingly, so, so this week I visited Mike uh, up in, at his place up in Rhode Island, and we shot um, photos and videos for an article and uh, a video on uh, window first window installations, um, or as Mike uh, taught us the term, uh, Western window installation. So um, and, this, and this actually was born on the podcast, and someone actually, I posted a picture of working with Mike and Andres, our video producer, online, and someone noticed, someone uh, asked, is this because you talked about it on the podcast? That was a really good, uh, that was a really <laughs> great observation from them. Um, so yeah, we had talked about uh, how to do this well when you have to, have to work in this order um, a few, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago on the podcast. And uh, Mike and I started talking about doing, making some content around it. And uh, we, we shot that this week, which I think Patrick, if it's, uh, if I can steal your thunder and introduce the after show. <laughs> um, <laughs> steal away, man. I'm going to play, play host for a little bit. Uh, the, the members only after show uh, that associated with this episode will be about uh, just this, uh, the process of, uh, creating content, the the work that the editors, uh, producers, and authors uh, do uh, to create our our magazine and video content, and uh, I think that um, you know there's a it's going to be an interesting conversation because you know for well for one thing people just might not know exactly how that all happens, um, and also you know there's so many readers who would make great contributors and listeners who would make great contributors to fine home building. Um, magazine or or videos and so maybe this uh maybe this after show encourages them to you know uh, pick up the phone or go to their computer and write us an email and send us some ideas for content um they'll know how to they'll have a good idea of how to uh how to do that how to get started that's a great idea i love this idea this was your idea mike for an after show and thank you very much for that yeah so i was recently on block island photographing john spear do a california valley uh intersecting kind of gabled roof and uh yeah, super fun. So we'll talk about that too. Jeff, what have you been doing? You got your water heater all um, data from your consumption. You got like you got yeah. the four or five dollars now. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I, I I should probably clarify that because that's really just the generation charge because Connecticut's electric bills are divided into generation and delivery, so that's just the generation charge. So it's probably twice that in 
real real dollars, but that's the only part I can control. Yeah, right. So uh, we should clarify, uh, you pay both for the power and uh, almost an equal amount for them to get it to you, right? That's exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the tune of 20-some cents a kilowatt hour, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't say I've seen the combined number. I mean, I've only, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, because you can choose who you're buying power from, you, those numbers are readily available because everybody's trying to undercut the guy next to them by a hundredth of a cent. <laughs> right. And uh, some folks don't read the fine print and figure out that their power uh, rate goes up pretty exponentially at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that and they get to take all your information and sell it to anyone and everyone. Oh. <laughs> the solar yeah. company. <laughs> Speaking of solar, Brian, how's your PV array doing? Uh, it, we are doing really well. Um, I think that uh, I think that we're you know the the app that uh, Sonova offers, um, which is the company that uh, I, I, I got uh, the PV installation from Trinity Solar, which is a company that does the installation, and then um, the the system is managed by a company called Sonova, and uh, the app that Sonova provides sort of um, they give you these different ways to look at your production and, uh, over, over the course of a week, a month, or uh, sort of lifetime of your system. And in the, in, in each of those, uh, areas, they give you a range of, uh, kilowatt hours. And that probably is because, you know, they can't predict weather and, and that kind of thing. So, um, they put, they give you this range and then they give you your actual production, and uh, so far, we've been staying in the, the higher end of the range, even some weeks even exceeding uh, the range. So I don't know, you know, that's that has nothing to do, of course, with, um, you know, our house or our system as much as it probably has to do with the weather and having probably, a, you know, favorable fall conditions this fall uh, for our system to be producing. So, you know, that feels good. I haven't gotten an electric bill yet. Um, so I haven't been able to see sort of the, the you know, the net um, of consumption and, and generation, but uh, I will. I'll let you know as soon as I do. I can't wait. I want to see what kind of Tesla you buy then with your surplus production. <laughs> I got an interesting press release uh, this past week, and uh, I'll share it with you all briefly here. Um, Eco Materials Technology announced today a second partnership with Georgia Power to harvest millions of tons of landfilled fly ash from Plant Branch, a coal-fired power plant that was retired in 2015, after announcing a similar project at Plant Bowen that has already begun construction. The effort will remove and beneficially use more than 8 million tons of fly ash that would otherwise sit in a landfill. The ash will be put through Echo Materials proprietary ES ecosystem efficient carbon offloading solution that will bring the ash to the required specification for use in concrete and other building materials. Ecomaterials see this, sees this as a program that should be duplicated across the country at many other coal plants where an unwanted byproduct can be used to create sustainable, stronger cement products. The ash from plant branch will be used in concrete blends to repair and construct bridges, roads, and buildings in Georgia and the rest of the southeastern United States, reducing dependence on imported materials. What do you guys think about this? We've kind of joked about this uh, situation that there's a shortage of this material. Not now. I was surprised to hear that uh, um, that there's so many uh, plants that have had these uh, settling ponds that are now just big, vast uh, areas of the fly ash that haven't been tapped yet because of that uh, report last year. It was a year before where they're saying they're running out of fly ash to put into concrete and it was affecting concrete production. So it's in a way good to know there's all this essentially waste material that we can mine for useful purposes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, it's, I want to see what it looks like. Uh, I'm guessing it's got to be better than the giant hill of fly ash that was there, right? I'm guessing nothing would grow on that. It's got to be just a big mountain of gravel looking stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, usually they send it all out in a slurry into settling ponds. It settles out. And then uh, once it kind of 
you know, the water either dries off or they drain it off, then it's, it looks like a, a salt flat for a while. And I don't know if they then kind of push it up with machines into a pile or if it's left in this uh, flat wasteland, essentially, or if they ever cover it. But you know, hopefully they know what they're doing if they're going to re be reprocessing it. Well, if anyone has seen these processes, it sounds like you have, Mike, uh, taking pictures, please. Uh, I would love to see what this, this looks like. It would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, this first uh, feedback comes from Wade. Hey, Patrick and crew, I thought you would adore the content of this video. This Japanese woodworker has been building a small structure and documenting the process. Look at how meticulous he is with the fiberglass bats, as well as the air barrier membrane and taping of the seams. On top of his attention to detail, he's not afraid to install the fiberglass without gloves or sleeves and comments that he's almost sad he doesn't feel the old itch as strongly as he once <laughs> did, one of the side effects of growing old. By the end of the video, he admits he's not very good at this kind of work, but the blower door results say otherwise at a whopping 0.4 air changes per hour. Keep in mind that smaller structures tend to be harder to achieve lower scores simply because of the reduced building volume. Lots of patient and methodical work to watch here as well as on the rest of his channel. I hope you all enjoy. Did you guys watch this video? Yeah. yeah it was fantastic. Yeah. Do you want to describe it, Brian? Well, I, I mean, I think we're going to put it on our on the show page, right? But yeah, yeah. Just, it just, it was just really like endearing video of a, I, I didn't look to see if this, um, if he's a professional or if this, I didn't, I didn't dive I think he's a deeper. furniture maker. He's a uh, furniture maker. Okay. craft, yeah. Yeah, he seemed to have skills, but I, I wasn't sure if this was his house or not. But yeah, it's just, it's just meticulous, meticulous work. Yeah. This is how you have to do bats, right, Mike? If you want them to work, you have to fit them. You don't jam them. And the bats that they were, he was using, I hope, I wish we could get it here. Um, yeah. it, it, they, they, you could tell right away when he cut the bale that they, usually when you cut a bale of, of fiberglass bats, they, they puff up, but these puffed up to the point where you didn't have to like lay them down and, and kind of shake them to get them to loft up. So they seemed a little bit denser, uh, and then they fit perfectly. And I don't know if that was his framing or that they cut their bats. It, it looked almost like, uh, when you install a, a rock wool bats that they're a bit stiffer uh, but these seem to be fiberglass so anyway yeah he's working they were with way a, more uh, dense than the yeah. normal at least the bats i've worked with let's just right. say that yeah, yeah he uh <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 gazing at it again he really uh was a the way he fit the way he cut you know these bats he was able to just really kind of gently press them into each bay and make them fit so nicely yeah, and he had a and couple it, of nice tips on how to uh, cut the uh, triangle, the uh, trapezoidal bats too. You know, drawing some lines on the on the sheathing of the floor, subfloor, and using that as a guide. And he used a knife that we've seen folks use for mineral wool. I don't know; I've seen anyone use it for fiberglass bats, but it seemed to work fantastic for mm -hmm. cutting them efficiently. So if you want to learn how to install bats the right way, <laughs> the video will be on the podcast page for you to check out. This comes from... Uh, you can't forget the PS. What? At the bottom of Wade's... Oh my God, this is so important. You're right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, <laughs> PS, please call on Jeff more often and don't let him get away with his quick one-word answers. <laughs> We know he's not a fan of the spotlight, but he's so brilliant and often has the best answers slash advice out of all of you. Of course he does. Yes, yes Jeff. Awfully nice of Uncle Wade to write in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Where does Uncle Wade live? <laughs> uh, well, I, I hope you take that to heart, Jeff. This comes from our friend uh, Evan Bachwig. Uh, the mold guy in Texas. Good afternoon, crew. In episode 600, you had a user who had bought a 2021 spec house right in with a question about how to manage dehumidification with a house that has multiple systems working to control the environment. Down here in climate zone 3A, we have similar problems. It's a challenge when I recommend that a client install a whole house ventilating dehumidifier that somehow should interface with the existing air handlers, hood vents, bath fans, ERVs, makeup air systems, etc. A potential option I've come across is the Haven Pro by ZOA. I do not have firsthand experience with it, but I like the concept a lot. 
It's an indoor air quality monitor, similar to what the writer of the question already has in his home, except it's installed on the return side of the air handler. Based on the readings it takes, it can modulate the equipment for you. For instance, if your humidity rises above a set point, then it turns on your dehumidifier. If the parts per million of 2.5 parts per million is high, it will turn on the ventilator. As home systems get more complex, interfaces like this will become necessary. I hope this helps. Keep up the great work on the content. Evan, Dallas, Texas. So have you all heard of this? It sounds really smart. No, I hadn't either. Once again, was, if you all have experience with this, we'd love to hear from you. What were you going to say, Brian? I, it was the first time that I had, I had heard of a air quality monitor that, that does your stuff. <laughs> yeah, interfaces with the HVAC system. And um, yeah. It seems like there's room for lots of this stuff out there, right? Like, yeah. Why isn't the air quality monitor integrated into the HVAC system? I'm sure that is on the very high end, but it doesn't seem like a huge technological hurdle to me to make that work together. This comes from uh, our friend Doug. Hey, Patrick and team. On episode 600, the after show, you touched on the F effects of the new energy codes for builders. I feel you have to also look at costs and say it's unsustainable. Recently, I was watching the new season of This Old House. The project is a mid-century home that has been added on in the past, and they are remodeling that portion as well as adding a large addition. It was explained that Massachusetts has passed a new energy code that because the addition is over 1,000 square feet, it will require the existing house to meet the new energy requirements. This will entail upgrading insulation in the walls and ceiling of the old portions. It was slated that this will add 25 to 30 percent to the cost of the remodel. Colorado has passed new energy requirements that are very controversial. Some of the claims of those opposed are bogus, such as it costing $2,000 more to wire a garage for an electric car. On a retrofit, maybe, but not a new build. I know some will say that energy savings will, over time, pay for the upgrades. This doesn't help the buyer who was already priced out of the market. When I finished our house in 2011, the county valued it at $200 and $55,000. Now they say it's worth six twenty-five. I don't see how anyone can buy their first home today. While energy conservation is important for our planet, at what point does it leave more people without a home? I look forward to some wisdom on this topic. All right, Jeff or Mike, this is wisdom as your uh, arena, <laughs> either one of you. One of the things that came to mind was there's an offset for a lot of that initial expense with some of the rebates and tax credits and things like that that are available now. Um, so it doesn't help with the initial hit, but it does help. Mike offsets. thoughts. I looked into the, um, that, uh, Massachusetts code and it just happened that yesterday, um, I was talking with the regional, Northeast Regional Rep for the ICC, and because he interfaces with building departments uh, all throughout New England and New York, I asked him about Massachusetts. And when I mentioned the, because I didn't know about this requirement that was profiled in this old house, that when you put a thousand square foot or larger addition on your house, you have to upgrade the entire house to the energy code. And he just kind of, I won't say rolled his eyes, but he um, diplomatically said, well, it's not really being enforced, um, that it was one of those initiatives that uh, got approved, but there was no uh, enforcement for it and no training for building officials. And building officials are just scratching their heads on what they have to do because it says in the regulation that, yeah, you got to upgrade the rest of the house, but then it gives no guidance in how anyone would do that. I just can't imagine that they'd be making people pull the drywall off the house or the siding uh, in order to uh, put additional insulation and then maybe upgrade the windows and so on. It would just seem to be really onerous. And like like um, Doug mentioned, you know, adding that 25 to 30 percent of the cost of the whole job when somebody just wants a remodel. I can see that if, if they do enforce it, that they're going to be a whole bunch of 999 square foot additions and nothing <laughs> larger just to avoid that. But this gets back to the, the whole point of uh, or issue of affordable housing and what's driving the cost of housing. 
um, more so than on the energy side, as Doug points out, the uh, increase in the assessed value of his property over just a short period of time, just uh, 10, 12 years, uh, over doubling the value. And we've seen that nationwide. What were you going to say, Brian? Uh, I don't think I was going to say anything because uh, Jeff, Jeff and Mike are doing such a good job with this answer. Um, but, but I, you know, I think that, I think that he, you know, there is sort of, there, it's such a complicated, complex, big issue, right? And he's, he's, he brings up sort of two things that are related, but, but also are unrelated. And, you know, the, the cost of remodeling and the cost of energy improvements is, is kind of one thing that affects the price of, um, well, it affects the price of that work. And then maybe that changes people's, um, that maybe that changes people's perceptions of the values of their home, but the real estate market is on its own trajectory, its own ups and downs that have nothing to do with largely have nothing to do with how much someone pays for some work to be done on their house. Right. Um, your house, you put a, you put a, you know, you put $50,000 into a interior remodeling project on your house and your, your value doesn't go up $50,000. The house is still worth what the real estate market says it's worth, which is largely based on, you know, location, property, and size. So those two things are, you know, they're, there's, they are connected, but they're also, you know, they're also unconnected. And, um, yeah, and I think, you know, it in terms of like what the, you know, what kind of what the right thing is to do with with energy codes and you know, and single family houses and whether single family houses are are sustainable at, at all, right? Are single family houses a sustainable um future for um housing in in our country? I don't know if that's if they are or not, um, you know, they're not, they're not, I don't think that the solution to the housing crisis are let are more affordable single family houses. Um, I think that's kind of a far fetched, um, that's kind of a far fetched idea. Um, it, you know, but it is a shame that, that someone, people, people get squeezed on their homes with things like this when, you know, uh, for, for the, you know, maybe, maybe good reasons, right. If, you know, in the midst of a, of a climate crisis, maybe, you know, energy performance is a great reason, but you know, when there's, when there's much bigger fish to fry in terms of industry and whatnot, and, and you just don't see this, you, you know, I'm not sure we see the same pinch there. I just want to say poor folks often have to put additions on their house because they can't afford to move. And, uh, maybe it's a thousand square feet. So you're going to make someone spend another third of their house value or more on, on making the house upgraded to current code. It seems unfair to me. And the disruption. Mm. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, your re remodeling's disruptive enough, but when you like, Put it all over the entire everything. house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That doesn't that that makes that makes very little sense. Well, the the root of it is that Massachusetts has the initiative to be statewide um, net zero or zero energy um, by or carbon free energy by uh, 2050. So decarbonizing the homes from the sense of the energy use um, that they need to upgrade because most of the homes that we're going to be living in in 2050 are already built. So I guess mm -hmm. their idea is to kind of force people in a way to upgrade their homes, which is going to be, yeah, cost prohibitive, really. Yeah, and, I think and, if it, you it, make poor people do that, you better incentivize it with some money because uh, it seems grossly unfair. To me. Yeah, and incentivize it so that people who maybe can't even afford an you know can't afford an addition on their home can can afford energy improvements. You yeah, know? that so seems person, to make a lot more sense. You know, yeah, the average person can just you know get some air sealing done in their attic and a better insulation package up there, and you know that kind of thing. Um, that's going to go a long way, I think, instead of waiting for big waiting to pick on big remodel projects. Exactly. Yep. Well, Doug, I hope that's the wisdom you were looking for. Uh, we'll see, <laughs> see if anyone writes in with better thoughts on the subject. Super complex, Brian. You're right about that. It's a big, big, big thing. Um, this comes from Steve. Steve in Queens. 
Hey, podcast crew, I love the show. Your team has kept me entertained on many an evening spent circling, circling the block in Queens, New York, looking for a parking spot. On unlucky parking nights, the silver lining is making it through a whole episode or more before I find a spot. I've been designing a family cabin for the past year and have been waiting on just the right question to come along before writing into the show. I hope this one provides you all with plenty to dig into. I'm working on foundation details for the small timber frame cabin I plan to build next summer in the Catskills in upstate New York, Climate Zone 6. The design is a bit of a Frankenstein, but it seems pretty solid to me. Best of all, it's very DIY friendly, which is what I'm aiming for. I'd love to get some expert takes on what I might be missing. The 32 by 24 foot cabin will sit on a slope and have a 20 foot deep walkout basement cut into the hill with the floor a bit above grade in front. There'll be a second story on top of the basement level. Behind the basement, I want to step up about four to six feet to another floor that will sit just above the higher grade further up the hill. To get below my 48 inch frost line, I plan to use a pier and grade beam approach, which is pretty typical for a small timber frame since all the load is concentrated on those piers anyway. For the floors, I'm intrigued by the concrete free slab idea and I think this might be a great application for that design. My specific questions are, are there any issues with using a concrete free slab inside my eight x eight pressure treated grade beam I'm thinking of the beams would be supported by concrete piers and also be sitting over six inches of crushed stone or gravel. This should keep them nice and dry and provide a solid support to mortise in the eight by eight posts that make up the frame. Inside those beams, the six inch deep layer of stone would continue, followed by an inch or two of pea gravel, two layers of three inch EPS foam to bring it up to the top of the beams, a vapor barrier and a double layer of pressure treated subfloor. Okay, let's answer this question first. Uh, I've been calling these an insulation slab. We've also called them a f concrete free slab in fine home building. Um, what do you guys think of this concept in general, and is there any reason not to do it in uh, this cabin structure? Well, I don't know much about the uh, pier and grade beam system, um, and maybe one of you guys do, but when you put the piers down, to frost line so you're not going to get any frost heaving at the piers but then you put that grade beam around the perimeter which though no structural members of the of timber frame would be resting on directly you would have the infill framing are those can frost get underneath that grade beam and heave it up I would suspect it could. Um, the question, I guess, is if the gra six inch gravel layer is going to be enough to provide drainage. And, and I don't think in a very cold place like uh, upstate New York, that's a good idea. Do you all agree? Hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. I, I know when you do a, 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 a frost protected shallow foundation, which looks very similar to when you're doing a grade beam, you need to have like face insulation on the outside and then in climate zone six, depending on the air freezing index, you'd need some horizontal insulation extending beyond the perimeter of the building just to uh, maintain or, or, or trap, so to speak, the uh, warmth of the earth so you're not getting frost developing under the grade beam. But again, we see these, uh, uh, you know, peer, uh, excuse me, um, pole barns going up in in very cold climates, Minnesota, Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, and they don't seem to have a problem with the concrete slabs getting raised up around the perimeter. So yeah, I don't know how that all works together. Uh, drainage, right? So good overhangs would help with that. Uh, some kind of uh, site control uh, for stormwater to manage it away from that uh, transition between the, the grade beam and the so just keeping pad. water, just keeping yeah. water away from the soil that could expand. Yeah, I thought of elevating this as a way to deal with this potential problem. Uh, you know, put the cabin uh, up on piers and have a air control layer under the ins under the floor system with you know joists and fibrous insulation. But I think this could work. That uh, Steve is suggesting. Yep. If. As long as there's no problem with the frost under the grade beam, it should work just fine. He asked, uh, secondly, where the floor steps up from the walkout level to the upper, upper level, I need a retaining wall. I'm thinking about taking the detail from the permanent wood foundation specification and using that as the retaining wall. The PWF will also wrap around a bit of the basement, 
where some of the end walls are below the sloping grade. Does this raise any red flags besides the red flags that get raised whenever PWFs are mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> Seems simple enough, and given the whole wall is under the cabin, I can't imagine there would be much water reaching it anyway. Uh, thanks a ton. I hope to hear what makes uh, your takes on my next alternate side parking night. Steve, <laughs> um, what do you guys think? Is this going to work to have the PWF uh, as a retaining wall kind of arrangement? Well, I don't know, but I have a question for Mike about it. <laughs> Because Mike Mike knows, um, so obviously the obviously the permanent wood foundation can work as as uh, as you know in terms of you know structure. And if he details it right, no problems there. Uh, but as this as this is just a retaining wall, and this is just one wall. So let's let's just for the sake of the reader that's trying to follow this, or listener, I say readers, trying to follow this um, without the drawings that we had, you know, he's got essentially a, a, a square, part of his foundation is a square, and then it's going to step up and along one wall for the retaining wall where it steps up, he wants to use the permanent wood foundation. But I wonder what's going to, because it's just one wall, what's going to keep that wall from wanting to fall forward? What's going to, what's going to help uh, reduce the pressure? It, and especially if he has, the, if he's using this, um, if he's not using a floor system to tie it back to the grade beam on the far end of that stepped up level of the house. Um, so Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? So it is interesting. Usually, so it, this would be the same, no matter whether it's a per, permanent wood foundation or even just a poured, uh, concrete foundation wall, retaining wall where you have a wall, of a certain height, he's got four feet six, and then you have a soil pressure on one side, you have to resist that soil pressure from tipping the top inwards. Right. So at the bottom, he doesn't have a problem with it sliding sideways because it's going to be buried a little bit down in the soil and it'll have that lower walkout level. On the upper level, what he's done, uh, and it's only when you look in the illustration, I think, will you have the illustration available oh, sure. on the, yeah, on the, um, the, the show notes, if anybody wants to look at this, cause it could be something somebody would want to incorporate, um, other than just Steve, but he's got the upper level floor. It's a, sort of a, it's like five feet higher than the, the low walkout level. And that is got a grade beam around it, eight by eight, right around the perimeter. And that eight by eight is on essentially on top of the permanent wood foundation. And then he has those cross-lapped um, layers of OSB that form the concrete free slab. And that's going to tie all the way over to the front of the building. So I'm figuring that just that friction uh, and, and the load on the forward most wall on the upper level would be enough that it's going to resist the the whole floor being pulled in so it's almost like dead men you can think of it that way when you when we build like a, a timber uh, retaining wall we'll often put uh perpendicular uh say six by sixes or four by fours back into the the raised bank the retained wall and then we'll put it like a t-bar at the end of that and we'll mm -hmm. screw it all or bolt it all together so that the retaining wall is being held by the soil that it's retaining. So it has to work as a unit mass. And I think Steve's accomplished that with the way he's using that grade beam and, beam and pier system. So I think he'll be safe. Do you think it would just be easier to build this thing on piers? I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry for pointing that out. He could, but when you look at the design, so, you know, he said he's got the, a 20 foot walkout and that 20 foot walkout is being, uh, by this, so he's got one level, the, the walkout level, then he has another level towards the front of the building, which is four feet, six inches up. So it's almost like a shelf within that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can think if you were in a big room, you're going to have a 20 foot tall ceiling, but then maybe like 16 or 15 foot of the ceiling will be, you know, uh, there'll be a, a second level, almost like a, a like mid a level. Yeah, like a loft. And if he was going to do it, all elevated, then he'd have to somehow have multiple piers and multiple levels with air flowing underneath and the air sealing all of that. So I think you either go with a full foundation or this grade beam and pier system works pretty good, especially for somebody who's going to try to do it themselves. Yeah. 
that's that's why this makes sense because that's these are what, relatively right. small pieces that you can mm -hmm. carry around without machinery. And you can dig your own footing holes, pour your own piers, drop your own grade beams, put your own sounds easy concrete. Yeah, it's just going to be a lot of work. <laughs> well, if it's a summer project, you know, it's a lot of nights and weekends. <laughs> It sure beats driving around Queens looking for a parking spot. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I know. I know. I wouldn't be in Queens. I'd be at the cabin all the time. Well, uh, I hope that you'll keep us uh, in informed of this project, Steve. It sounds like a lot of fun. And send us some photos of the building site because the Catskills are amazing. Yeah, um, and process, that's process photos too. We want to see yeah. how you accomplish all this because it could be a useful thing for other people. And I want to know your uh, body mass index when you're done with this, because I'm guessing you're going to be pretty fit. This comes from uh, Wyatt. Um, hey, guys, love the podcast. Still slowly working my way through the earliest episodes. And along the way, you may have answered this, but here goes. As a little background, I'm located in the Pacific Northwest. My house is a 1996 Rambler with a crawl space. At a certain point, we did a whole house remodel consisted of removing one non-load-bearing wall and rerouting electric that was in the wall, moving a wood stove from the dining room to the living room, new kitchen cabinets, countertops, and a new floor, amongst other minor details. I say flooring for one of the last things for obvious reasons. I chose flooring for the guest bedroom first. Installation went well, but I wasn't a fan of the design once laid down over a large area, so I decided to switch it up for the nursery and loved it. Both are LVP, they were from Floor and Decor. New Core was the brand. But I can confirm, uh, basically, it was a tongue and groove LVP with ends that were not tongue and groove, but clicked together to form a watertight seal. Now on to the common areas of the house. But there's one problem. My wife doesn't like how the dark nursery floors are for the rest of the house. So we branch outside the Floor and Decor and end up landing on an LVP from LL Flooring. This flooring was significantly more difficult to install as it has a tongue and groove along the length and the width. However, I get the common areas floored and the, I, put an un, I put an underlayment on top of the subfloor, which was thoroughly cleaned and destapled prior. I flooring sat in, up in the home for a few weeks prior to installation to acclimate. Now, here's the issue. While the two bedrooms remain looking great, there are many spots along the common areas where the flooring has popped apart lengthwise between boards since installation. I'm not sure why this has happened, and although I'm dreading the proper answer is to reinstall it or something else, I'm curious you, if you guys have another fix. Pictures are attached. Uh, thanks very much, Wyatt. What do you guys think? So this gentleman has a large area of this LVP flooring and down the center of it uh, between rows, the long ways is what looks like, I don't know, a 3 16th quarter inch gap that's pretty darn obvious because the core of the flooring is uh, very light in color and the top is much darker. So it shows up pretty obvious. Thoughts, mm -hmm. anyone? Well, this, I couldn't tell from his description because he called it a tongue and groove and it was difficult to get together. Some of them are tongue and groove and others are like, I would say a click lock where you, the tongue and the groove, you kind of have to enter at an angle and then drop it down. So it, it interlocks. So I don't know if it's an interlocking type of flooring because usually this does not happen with an interlocking type of flooring, but I can see if it was just a simple tongue and groove where if there's any movement, in the subfloor or in the flooring itself due to temperature or, well, I guess it would be temperature variations because humidity wouldn't really affect a luxury vinyl plank, um, that the, uh, that it would just shrink at some point And then it's like a, a relief cut somewhere in it, in, in a concrete, uh, expansion joint, contraction joint really. And it just contracted and you get this gapping. Can you fix it without pulling it all up and putting it back down? <laughs> I've had this happen with some interlocking flooring, and the only way we could resolve to fix it was to pull it all up and put it back down. Brian's nodding. If, yeah. If you I helped someone uh, with a similar problem once, and, and you know, it, interestingly, I think that in the case that – I think that in the situation that, that I was working on that um, it was uh, – it was a 
you know, floating floor. And I feel like they, they left too much space for the floor to move around, around the perimeter. Um, and, and I think it, it, it might, this was all a guess, but I think it was a combination of, um, movement and then, and then the floor actually being able to move around. Um, but yeah, we had to take up the flooring as back as back, as far as we had, you know, as far as the gaps were, uh, to close them up and then, and then reinstall it. And uh, we put some spacer blocks in underneath the just little, little, I call them blocks, little shims, um, essentially underneath the, the baseboard to not have such a, not have such Between the so wall much space. Uh, yeah. and, and the flooring. So it couldn't yeah. uh, retreat, let's say. It could, yeah. It couldn't move as far. And that was a guess, but I didn't know what else was, I didn't know what else had caused it. Hmm. I'm going to suggest, uh, can we put opposing wedges between the flooring and the wall and try and uh, drive these back together? Is, is that at least worth a shot? If you can get to the edge of the material and, you know, sometimes if it's buried under baseboard, you might have to remove the baseboard, but that's not a bad idea. The only thing that might happen if these are big essentially think of this continental drift and you've drifted apart these <laughs> two big continents we're in a spreading uh, zone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mid-atlantic rift and now you were trying to bring that back together as you put pressure or you're trying to draw the outsides to the center it might buckle tent Be- before right, it they might pop up. Yeah. yeah, the middle might yeah. pop up before you actually move it. But you could try a combination of things, put a little bit of pressure on it, and then get four or five of your friends and like run towards the the joint where it's not comfortable <laughs> and just slam your feet down, make sure you got some good rubber soled sneakers on, and that way it'll that gripping force of your mass might help to uh, connect them back together. But if you had trouble getting these tongues and grooves to uh, align Go together, yeah. you're going to have a massive problem when you're trying to get this joint to come back together. And if they're the, if the, if it's a type of flooring you mentioned, Mike, where you have to, where it actually is locking, then you're not going to be able to just jam it against the, the two pieces yeah. together. You're going to have to get to them so that you can click them in the appropriate way. One of the recommendations I have for people who have not experienced this yet and are going to be putting down um, any type of engineered flooring, I'll, I'll link in the, the luxury vinyl plank with that, is read the instructions carefully. Um, often with some of the, what I would call lower grades of these products, they're going to have uh, limits on the uh, floor area that you can cover without a control joint mm-hmm. because they realize that they have expansion and contraction, which is uh, above and beyond what you could accommodate in a very large area, like a commercial grade flooring, you wouldn't have that because they'll, they'll do, you know, 10,000 square feet with just a couple of control joints. And if they don't have any restrictions on air, mat, uh, the uh, unit area, the, the maximum unit area you can cover without a control joint, call the company and ask because it might not be something that's in their regular instructions or check their website because yeah, you just don't want to have that problem where you get the shrinking without um, and, and, and the joints opening up or, or the converse of that, which is where it expands a little bit and then you get buckling. And that's what the control joints are for. Good advice. I'm going to say buy an area rug and uh, get on with your life. And uh, Color ruggables, <laughs> ruggables, we've bought a few of those for our place. And they're super durable and washable and, and they look great. So, um, This comes from Keith. Hey there, I've been on a board and batten siding kick for a few years now and really appreciate the ease of install, durability, aesthetics, etc., there are various local mills here in Oregon, on the Oregon coast where I can source great material like Port Orford cedar for my board and batten projects, or I can fell a few trees at my place and mill up some board and batten if I'm feeling like a workout. I'm devouring some fun building science books, and, and the emphasis on rain screens for siding is getting me to ponder a board and batten rain screen. All the details I see call for vertical strapping over o- OSB or plywood, with horizontal siding material like fiber cement lap siding. So any good ideas for board and batten rain screens? I'm assuming I just run horizontal strapping so I can attach vertical board and batten siding. 
I worried that the bands of horizontal strapping would be moisture dams trapping the downward flow of water on the WRB. Should I just do gaps on the strapping every two feet or so? Any ideas on a strapping product that can run horizontally across the building while letting moisture run down? So I love this question, Keith, because so many questions of the podcast, there is not an answer. We can actually give an answers for this particular uh, question, right? Mike's nodding. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, there's a few answers. Um, one, you could put on one of the house straps that has the, um, the either dimples on it like um, the hydrofilament, hydro gap products from Tamlin and from um, Benjamin, Benjamin Ott, Ott, like, yeah. some other, some others from Tyvek and DuPont and some, uh, forget the other company. There's a few companies that have that. So that would help with the drainage side. So Mike, when you, when you make that suggestion, you're suggest you're, you're suggesting to use the dimpled uh, house wrap and then do um, horizontal, Yep. Yeah, so there's, so there's drainage behind your furring strips because yep. the, because those products provide the drainage plane, but not the ventilation. So now right. you're getting now you're getting both. Okay, yep. cool. Yeah, and for the ventilation side, um, now I'm figuring that it, out there in in uh, Pacific Northwest, you're going to be uh, getting these for the boards from a mill. They're probably going to be rough sawn, so there's pretty much going to be a fair amount of little micro gaps here and there between the back of the boards and the battens and the siding itself, plus between the, the gap you leave between the board and the battens you put on, that you're going to get enough air moving through there to help dry out. Now, it's not going to be a big continuous amount of air that's moving through, but it should be sufficient that you wouldn't necessarily need to put any gaps in the strapping, although that could help. Um, I talked to Paul Eldrenkamp, uh, the founder of Big Meister, many years ago, and he described a rain, he wrote in, an, uh, uh, anyway, he, he described a uh, house that he was taking apart for remodeling, and it had good condition cedar shingles, which were over 80 years old, put on horizontal one by three battens that were five inches apart, but with no intake or exhaust vents. And he said the siding was in, in impeccable shape and they were just putting an addition on. So his feeling was you don't necessarily need that intake and exhaust continuity for airflow behind wood cladding because you're going to get some air moving through there that's going to help dry into that little uh, inch and a half or so space. So it should be good. And there That's are been the consensus ways. on uh, GBA too, is that you don't really need a lot of drying uh, or, or drainage, right? It, it, these these cavities can be largely closed off and still be effective. Yeah. And yeah. if you are concerned and you do want to improve the drainage, instead of putting the battens horizontally, put them at a slight diagonal and leave that two inch gap every you know two or four feet, and then the water is going to hit the back of that the, the top of that batten, slow down dribble through and then you get a little airflow. So but the no nails question. aren't going to be nice and level. That drives me crazy. I hate looking <laughs> at the uh, siding that's, right? But if the you old, put the battens on an angle, you have to nail the, the siding on similarly, right? But if you're doing a board and batten system correctly, you should not see any nails in the boards. Those are Do you want to explain that to folks? Um, well, you can put the nails... <laughs> <laughs> Within a half of an inch of where the battens go, size the batten to cover those nails, and then the only nails you'll see are the ones in the battens. <laughs> and you want you actually want the nails on the uh, edge of the board so they can move, right? Yeah. That's the, yeah. that's the yeah. part of it, yeah. yeah. So. And, and core vents another solution to this core problem, vent. right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. they have a batten that 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 is corrugated and drains. Yep. Um, I've seen people do. Uh, install first vertical furring strips and then horizontal <laughs> furring strips. I've seen people do that for cedar shakes, which is, wild, which is wild. It's a ton of work, but it's doable. Um, they're the 3D mesh products, right? They could work yeah. um, in this cedar case. Cedar breather and uh, yeah. home slicker are the home products slicker. you mean. Yep. Yeah. And I've also seen people do what they call reverse board and batten where every, every um, joint is backed up by a vertical strip so you just you install a furring strip at let's say if you're doing 12 inch uh boards you have a furring strip behind every one of them um mm -hmm. and as, as long as as long as you're hitting i guess as long as you're hitting studs where there are studs you're not 
you, you know, the others can be fastened right to the sheathing because you've got the same fastening that you would without those um, into into your framing. So that that could work too. So there's there's tons of ways to to do this. Um, I, what, what's your idea, Jeff? You've been uh, well, very patient. Well, no, no, no. Uh, what T111 strips has been done. Uh, so cut T11 strips and turn them around, right? Yeah. So the the groove is uh, <laughs> facing the sheathing. That's a great idea. Oh yeah. I was thinking similarly, you know, you take your strapping and you run it over a dado uh, head cutter on your table saw, right? And you make a series of little notches. Um, and I have more time than money, so that's probably the approach I would take. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my suggestion in a Coastal Contractor article on installing white cedar shingles with a rain screen. And that's the one that Paul commented on. He goes, that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Instead, just put the boards up and battens, excuse me, the battens up and don't worry about it. Yeah. And that's something that like, like the question about whether, whether or not you need pressure treated battens, right? A lot of people are, get concerned that you need to have pressure treated because it's going to be wet. And, and the answer is no, you're creating a system that dries. That's the whole point of the ventilation gap, right? Is that, is that things can dry back there. There are a few things in our world that I think people overthink than uh, rain screen detailing. Honestly, it's it's more about a little drainage and, and the drying seems to take care of itself uh, if you just don't keep things soaking wet all the time. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts on this subject? Board and batten siding, good, bad? Got to have good window flashing, right, Mike? It especially at the top because it's uh, less forgiving than other uh, cladding types. How is it less forgiving in a way? You think? Um, because, like, unlike uh, lap siding or shingles, um, uh, board siding doesn't have a natural shedding, uh, you know, ability. You, you need siding um, at the bottom of boards to kick it out uh, over, over windows, for example. Do you think I'm wrong about that? Well, I guess over a window, you just have a good cap flashing and leave yeah. a little gap. And then, you know, as long as you've got a finish or a seal around the ends, uh, ends of those boards with a quarter inch gap, the water is going to kick out over the top of the window and you do another flashing at the bottom of the window that would pick up the, uh, the top of the boards. Um, and I think, you know, just think about vinyl siding, you know, water gets behind that stuff. And as long as you leave the gap, and that's the important thing that Keith is thinking about is leaving a gap behind the board and batten. I think probably where people run into more problems is where they do a board and batten where the big plump boards are in direct contact with the house wrap. And that's mm -hmm. where, water that gets back there kind of festers, but leaving that gap is going to solve those problems, even if water does get in above or below a window or a door. I'm going to say with overhangs and vertical <laughs> siding over 30 pound felt is pretty redundant. It's pretty good system. And I've looked at my own building that I'm it's talking to you from, uh, I've had a chance to pull the siding off and that's all this back. There is a layer of 30 pound fell and it was wrinkly when I put the siding on it and it's perfectly dry back there. <laughs> Super easy. I stunned you guys. You're like, <laughs> I, 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 I what, is, <laughs> you think that's a bad idea, Mike? What? Putting it directly over? Yeah, I put it directly on felt paper. I'm not saying house wrap, but felt paper. I think it's perfectly fine. Felt paper is like the best WRB on the planet. Well, maybe not the best, but it's close to the best. It, it works in all the right ways. When it's wet, it dries better. Uh, when it's dry, it resists water. You know, it's, it's wrinkly, you, which helps with that drainage. Now, think about when, that, when tar paper first came out you know, like 120, 140 years ago. And do you think they were talking about it in that fashion? Like, we've got this great product. It, it's got variable permeability depending on the moisture content. <laughs> they were like, this keeps the wind from blowing between the boards and it doesn't <laughs> doesn't get eaten by the insects like the, the like the red rosin paper did, <laughs> right? Because it's soaked in tar, right? Nothing is going to eat this. Tar. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't know what they had when they made it. They made something that was just remarkably good, kind of like Dupont stumbling on Tyvek. You know, it's like <laughs> oh, 
This stuff what do we do with this, right? Characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, uh, the initial stuff we thought it would be good for is a non-woven plastic uh, fabric product. I think their genius with Tyvek was putting the name all over it so folks would see it when houses were under construction. <laughs> that perhaps is the greatest uh, uh, marketing uh, move ever. The, no. only pe- the only thing that may have outdone that was uh, Huber deciding to make Zip green. Because, yeah, you know, true. it's just like you, the first, the, you know, the first builder drove by the first zip, zip sheath house and they said, what is that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, so uh, in the after show, and I hope you all are all access members, if you are, you'll want to hear us talk about our uh, trips to uh, job sites recently, both Brian and I, and uh, get Mike's perspective of like what it's like to have one of us uh, editors slowing them down and d- disrupting their work, uh, <laughs> making fine home building content. So it should be fun. I, I look forward to talking about my trip to Block Island and um, Brian, you got to go to Rhode Island. So cool. Yeah. Any uh, parting thoughts, gents? All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike, Brian, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps up other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Alive. Stay tuned for the after show. Thanks. Thanks.